Okay. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to, a, I think, a very exciting topic about female pelvic organ prolapse and the female exam. I think we all come from very different backgrounds, so I wanted to make this as generalizable as possible. So just a brief introduction. I'm Marissa Clifton. I am the newly appointed residency program director at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And um, I absolutely love medical education. I love female urology. Um, and I think this initiative is going to really inspire us to have a different thought process when we approach resident education, even medical student education. So thanks for having me. I have no relevant disclosures or any disclosures at all. I do have to give a shout out to my mentor, Dr. Howard Goldman. He has been one of my big supporters in female urology, and he also has helped with portions of these slides. So I have to, I have to give credit when credit is due. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is an introduction to pelvic organ prolapse. It's a kind of a complicated idea, and we don't spend a ton of time talking about it in urology, at least as much as I think we should. And then we're going to talk about the female urology exam and how important it is. I'm going to introduce you to the POPQ. Some of you may be very familiar with this a quantitative evaluation tool, but I think we should become more facile with it. And then we're going to talk a little bit about basics of prolapse management. So I would like to do a quick poll to see where all of our residents get their female urology cases. So if we can pull that up and just wait a second for results, that would be great. Okay, so I think that's that's percolating and as those scores are kind of coming in, I'd like to talk a little bit about what is prolapse. Well, the International Continent Society um, defines it as the descent of one or more of the anterior vaginal wall, posterior vaginal wall, the uterus, cervix, or the apex of the vagina. Okay, so great. You all have fellowship trained female pelvic urologists, and I think that's fantastic. But some of you don't, so hopefully we can give you a little bit of an exposure here. So importantly, when we talk about what prolapse is, we need to make sure that we can find it, and when we see signs of it, we have to correlate the degree of prolapse with the symptoms. So usually we're not gonna to expect to see a lot of symptoms unless the prolapse is beyond the hymenal ring. So previously people talked about the organ, so a cystocele, but currently we think of that as anterior vaginal wall prolapse, enterocele or uterine prolapse, but now we kind of reclassify that as apical prolapse, and rectocele, which is really posterior vaginal wall prolapse. The reason is that the organ does not necessarily correspond with the prolapse bulge that is seen. And so I think it's important to think about prolapse in these terms. So how does it happen? Well, it's because the female pelvic floor has a very important job. It basically prevents our abdominal contents from falling outward, and in men as well. It controls storage and evacuation of feces, and in women, it allows for conception and partuition. It's composed of two components. So you have the viscerofascial layer, which is the connective tissue. This is the endopelvic fascia that we talk about all the time. And then you have the muscular layer, which is really in charge of supporting the female uh, internal organs. So if your muscles are functioning normally and you have basically normal function, no injury, here you can think of the muscles as the water and the boat as the abdominal contents. Ligaments are just ropes kind of keeping the boat from floating away, but the ma majority of the support of the boat is through the water or the muscles. However, if the pelvic floor is damaged or weakened, those organs have to be supported then by the ligaments. So you can see here, there is no water and basically the ropes are supporting the entire weight of the boat. So I like that analogy. And people say, how do the muscles get injured? Well, there's a thought that yes, they tear. Yes, they're stretched, certainly during delivery or heavy coughing or lifting or those types of things. But really there's a neurological injury that occurs as well. And so this can lead to some kind of muscle dysfunction. And we know that this may not be apparent until years later. So it's important to think about these injuries as long-term injuries, not just immediate ones. 
We know prolapse is common. It occurs in over 50% of women over 50. We also know that women are getting older. It's the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population. So we can anticipate there's going to be a higher need in the upcoming decades to have repairs for pelvic organ prolapse. And though the majority of adult women do have some element of pelvic organ prolapse, it's only symptomatic in the vast minority. So what are risk factors for prolapse? Well, we know there is a definitely a family history. There's a race and ethnicity predilection. So it's more common in whites and Hispanics, less common in Asians. Age, the older you are, the more likely you are to have it, but certainly there are collagen disorders and neuromuscular diseases. Then there are the environmental factors. Did you have a vaginal delivery? What was the size of the baby? Have you had a hysterectomy? Previous prolapse repairs, a high BMI, are you smoking? Do you have chronic cough, constipation? And do you do a lot of lifting? So all of these risk factors work together to create prolapse. Well, what really causes prolapse symptoms? Well, symptoms increase usually when the leading edge of the prolapse is beyond the hymenal ring. So what are symptoms? I have a lot of patients coming in for various complaints, as much as like low back pain or um, lower abdominal sharp pain. And you really have to be careful when you evaluate symptoms and attribute the symptoms to the appropriate cause. So when it's from prolapse, they may have obstructive urinary symptoms, certainly if the prolapse is quite significant, but certainly if they see or feel a bulge, that's pretty much a, a red flag that they may have some element of prolapse. So you should do an exam. We do know urinary incontinence is not strongly associated with prolapse, and so that's an important idea to kind of keep those two separate disease processes separate. So when I see a patient in the office, I ask them, what are your symptoms? You can have a heaviness sensation. You can have a vaginal bulge. I'm always a little concerned when they come in and say that their main complaint is dyspareunia and it's because of their prolapse. Um, they can have difficult voiding and defecating, especially if they have a significant prolapse. And I ask them, do you splint? Do you push it back up? And when you reduce it, does it help you evacuate better? And then of course you wanna ask them about their status of their incontinence. Most importantly, however, I believe is asking the patient how much it bothers them. If it doesn't bother them at all, then we're gonna have a different conversation than if it really does bother them. So a little bit about the history that I just wanna give my two cents when I see these patients. I think it is so very important to really have the patient nail down what are their symptoms. Because if they're coming in to see you because their gynecologist said they have prolapse and they have pelvic pain, you may have a different thought process when you do that examination. Um, the other thing that you really need to identify is the degree of bother. So in patients who really don't have a, a ton of bother, you're not gonna recommend the same things that you would if there was a lot of bother. So let's go to the female GU exam. So I have a funny story and it doesn't mean to be uh, negative at all, but when I first started my job here, we didn't have any speculums in the office. So I understand that prostate cancer is very important and I really do believe it is, but I also think our female patients are very important. So I would encourage everyone to have examination tools for women. And why is that? Because women have urology needs as well. And we honestly are trained very well to identify pelvic abnormalities. And we may do it in a way that's even different and better than some of our GYN colleagues. I think sometimes we're scared of the tools that some of the gynecologists or other FPMRS surgeons use. And so I really make it very simple. I use a half speculum and I don't use any other fancy devices. But I think if you are, no matter what field you're going into, deciding to uh, be a good caregiver, a good urologist, you need to know how to do a physical exam. So just to get our terminology a little bit more complete, I think that we should just go over the basics. So the vulva is outside of heart's line. So here on this uh, exam, you can, this picture, you can see that heart's line is right here. And everything outward of it is considered the vulva. The vestibule is between heart's line and the hymenal ring. And this is endoderm, so it has androgen receptors on it. And when you talk about the vagina, it's between the hymen and the cervix, so it's the internal aspect. Using those definitions can be helpful when you're describing patient symptoms and also for the overall examination. Sometimes we also fail to give a, a good 
clitoral examination of our patients. And so here you can see this patient has um, uh, atrophic vaginitis, but you do see here that there's the glands of the clitoris and then you have the hood that's visible. However, in this patient, which is actually the same patient, but the patient before treatment, you can't actually see the glands of the clitoris. So this patient has phimosis and if they had sexual dysfunction or pain, you may need to intervene to help treat that. So I want to do another quick poll. This is just your in-service question poll. Um, a gardener's duct cyst is a vestigial remnant of which of the following? Okay, so we will let you take a few minutes to answer and wait for that to come in. Um, and we'll go on with the external exam. Importantly, estrogen status is something we should always be looking at. I think we as urologists do a better job at this than some of the other aspects of the female exam. But after menopause, you can see basically the loss of the labial labial and vulvar fullness, and you can even lose the labia minora. And also you see this pallor. So it's not so much necessarily that the vaginal tissue is dry. You can have a decrease in vaginal moisture. It's more of this whiteness of the appearance and the loss of the rugae that kind of tells you that maybe they haven't had estrogen exposure in a while. Um, you also want to assess for presence of a caruncle. In urology, you will see this all the time and it is very important. On the urethral examination. Perfect. Mesonephric duct. Excellent job. I can tell everyone's been studying there in service. So on the urethral examination, you'll want to see if the urethra is pinpoint, obviously, but you're looking for those urethral caruncles. Usually they appear at the six o'clock position. They have a very typical appearance, maybe even a little bit darker than that. Um, you also want to assess for urethral prolapse. So what is the difference between urethral prolapse and a caruncle? Basically, a prolapse is where the urethelium has, or the um, urethra has bulged outward in a circumferential way. And sometimes it can be twisted or torsed and that can cause extreme pain uh, and that's an operative emergency. So identifying this can help alleviate a lot of concerns because I've had referrals from our GYN team members that just aren't familiar with that entity. The periurethral exam is to identify, are there urethral diverticuli? Also, look at the glands. This is a Skeen's gland cyst that you can see here. It's kind of pushing up on the urethra, and you can see that slit-like urethral meatus. Abscesses, and something we don't want to miss is a urethral malignancy, and this is a primary urethral carcinoma. When I do these exams, I also evaluate the pelvic floor. I think sometimes we fail to do this and you say, well, they're here for prolapse. Why are you gonna assess the pelvic floor? Well, if they have very tight levators, I'm going to suggest possible physical therapy before I proceed with a surgery. You say physical therapy, you don't do physical therapy for prolapse. Well, actually you don't, you're right. You're not gonna, you'll maybe help some of the symptoms mildly and you're not gonna cure their prolapse. But what I do it for is to really get them prepared for surgery. It helps decrease their discomfort if their pelvic floor is in appropriate tension. Um, and it also impacts the choice of anti-incontinence procedure I may proceed with. Of course, in a female exam about prolapse, you have to assess for incontinence. So you want your patient to cough with a full bladder. If they've already urinated and you've done a PVR, you can do off systometry, put a catheter in, you fill the bladder up, you can observe if there's a detrusor contraction or not, and then you can have the patient cough and strain with a full bladder. Now, if they don't leak while they are lying down, you need to have them maybe stand up. And in patients with prolapse, it's important to reduce the prolapse with a half speculum. It's really easy to do. And that way you can assess for occult stress incontinence because that will help your guidance as well. I think it is important to highlight, you need to recognize what needs to be fixed, and it's just as important to be able to recognize it as it is to know how to fix it. So the prolapse exam, again, I use a half speculum. You can get a lot of information that way, and you don't miss some prolapse because you're fumbling with um, uh, the standard speculum. And it is the most important part of diagnostic testing. This is what tells me what I'm going to do from a prolapse repair standpoint. And you're going to examine the anterior and posterior walls and the apex and the uterus and the perineal body. I've also found occasionally that when we 
look, we find that actually a patient that has had a hysterectomy has had a super cervical hysterectomy, right? So they still have a cervix there, um, and they may call it a partial hysterectomy. So you can get a lot of additional information by closely examining the, a, um, the apex. And if they have a cervix that's in place, you may need to have testing if they haven't had some sort of follow-up testing in terms of um, pap smears. So I think it's a, an important piece of information to have. Again, you're going to reduce the prolapse when you look for stress incontinence. Um, so on this picture, I think this is a good example. If you just look, you can't tell where the bulge is coming from. It's not apparent. It could be, be from the posterior wall. It could be from the anterior wall. It could be the apex. And you can see with basically the half speculum, this is very clearly an anterior wall prolapse. And if you see, my, my mentor actually did a stress test because you can see pooling of urine right there um, on the speculum. And when you look on the posterior wall, it's actually very well supported. So it gives you additional information. So the POP-Q, I think, is a very important tool, but for urologists, we're maybe a little bit unfamiliar with it. I think it has a lot of merit, and I think it's something we should become facile with. And the best way to figure it out is to just keep using examples and trying it in practice, and it starts to make more sense. So it's a quantification tool. It allows some reliability between practitioners in terms of what we're seeing, and you can also compare outcomes after surgery. So it's very important for literature, and it creates these standards. And I think almost universally, people have moved to the POP-Q evaluation for pelvic organ prolapse. I think an important aspect to highlight is that you have to quantify the stage based on the most distal compartment. So whatever is the most severe prolapse, whether it's anterior, apical, or posterior, that's going to determine your stage of prolapse. When you do your exam, you need to do it at maximal strain. So if you have a patient that's lying supine on a table, you're going to need them to strain to make sure that you replicate what their true bulge is. It also opens up the genital hiatus, so you get a larger value for that, and it may shrink the perineal body. So patients when you're doing an exam, you need to make sure that what you're seeing is what they see. Very frequently, I have patients say, this doesn't, this isn't what it is. When I'm at home, it's worse than this, or at the end of the day, it's worse than this. So there are a couple of different things that you can do. One, you can have your patient strain. You can put a mirror on the floor, and then you turn the mirror up, and then you and the patient can look and say, okay, is this what you're seeing? Is this similar to it? If they say, no, it's not. It's not at all like what I normally experience. It's much worse than this. You know, sometimes I have my patients take pictures pictures and send them to me, or I do an examination at the end of the day after the patient's been up moving around rather at the beginning of the day. So when we look at the POP-Q measurement tool, we're going to be measuring in centimeters. And we have to remember that the hymen is the fixed point. It's not the introitus, it's actually the hymen. And the plane of the hymen is defined as zero. So you can see that purple arrow there. Any prolapse above that zero is considered negative, and any prolapse below is considered positive. And so that's how the system works. The POP-Q tool has six points in total. So you have AA, BA, so the anterior wall, you have C and D, which are at the apex, and then you have the AP and the BP, which is posterior, the P for posterior, and those are points. You have three measurements. You have the genital hiatus, you have the perineal body, and then the total vaginal length. Again, these are measurements. The important thing about the A point is that this is anatomically defined. It is defined by taking a ruler and basically in the midline of the anterior wall, going three centimeters proximal from the hymen, and then along the posterior wall, going three centimeters proximal. And so you have a defined range of three, above and below. So negative three and positive three. So again, it's on the anterior wall, it's the midline anterior vaginal wall, three centimeters above. The reason this point is important is that is thought to be the place where the urethral vesicle junction exists. So if you're looking for urethral hypermobility, you're going to look at the AA point and how the AA point moves. The AP point is the same thing along the posterior wall. And again, it's the range is negative three to positive three. Okay. The B point, this is a little bit tougher to conceptualize. This is a dynamic point. This is a point that we define as the most 
collapsed distal position of prolapse along the vaginal wall. So when it's BA, anterior, that's the anterior wall prolapse. When it's BP, that's the posterior wall prolapse, okay? The value in a patient without prolapse is the same as AA for BA and the same for, AP, for BP as AP. So it's a negative three value for the B point. And we'll go over this in a couple of different ways to hopefully help solidify some of these ideas. So again, when you're talking about the BA and the BP point, you're talking about a dynamic point, not a defined one on a ruler. It's a moving point. And this is the most distal point of any part of vaginal wall prolapse from the cervix to the point A. Okay, so your value is negative three. If it's no prolapse, it's negative three. However, if you have prolapse, it can range all the way from negative three to positive total vaginal length. So again, the A point's important when you're talking about urethral hypermobility because that's the area of the urethral vesicle junction. The B point is important for prolapse. So it's gonna tell you the vaginal wall most distal in prolapse. Your C point is the most distal edge of the cervix when you have a uterus or if it's a supracervical hysterectomy, that's the C point. Or the leading edge of the vaginal cuff if someone doesn't have a cervix, like they had a complete uh, a, a hysterectomy. So what is point D then? Well, this is the posterior fornix and it corresponds to the pouch of Douglas, D for Douglas. This is really the level of the uterosacral ligament attachment. So this can be important for us when we're trying to determine does someone have prolapse or not. So if you just did an exam and you had your cervix and it was a very long cervix, your cervix may be a negative three. But if you actually go and look at the D point, that is well supported. It's negative eight. And what you would know is that the symptoms of that bulge is actually just a very long cervix. So it may change what you end up doing. It's a subtlety. I know it's sometimes a little bit too much information, but I certainly think it's an important point. Um, but the D point sometimes doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in women that have had a hysterectomy. So the genital hiatus, how exactly is that defined? Well, it's the middle of the urethral meatus, so the middle of the urethral meatus to the posterior hymen. The perineal body is defined as the posterior margin of the genital hiatus to the mid-anal opening, or that posterior hymen to the mid-anal opening. And the total va vaginal length is basically the greatest depth in the vagina in centimeters. That's really important because if you have a shorter vagina, you're going to change how you repair it versus a, a longer vagina, et cetera, et cetera. And you want to um, do the measurement without, without straining. Obviously, you want to get the full idea of the length of the vagina. You don't want it to be shortened because you're straining. So um, I think we have a poll question about uh, describe the range of possible BA according to the POP-Q. This is just to check the, that you all are listening and people haven't checked out. The in-service loves these questions. Okay, well, I'll give everyone a quick minute to finish that and we'll keep going. So as those are getting completed, everyone just needs to take a nice deep breath as we look at the grid, the pop Q grid. Um, this, this is the way that we look at the pop cue, and you'll see almost everyone look at it this way. I like to break it down to think of this as, again, these are your points. These are your measurements, points, and these are measurements, okay? I like it because it just makes sense. It's like you're walking around a, a vagina. You've got the anterior wall. Oh, then you're at the back, there's cervix. D, and then posterior wall. So that's how, how I kind of remember the order of the grid. And remember, these are all measurements. Um, so they're calculated. So a little bit about prolapse stage, because it can be slightly confusing. 
when you think about stage zero is basically there's really no prolapse or there's maybe one or two centimeters of something maybe moving a little bit on the apical um, side of things. So zero is considered perfect. The only time it's going to be perfect is maybe when you're born. Otherwise, there's usually some degree of laxity. So what is stage one? Well, it's highlighted here in this orange box. And um, stage one basically is any amount of prolapse up until negative one centimeters from the hymen. Hymenal ring right here, this is negative one. Anything above negative one is considered stage one. Stage two, including negative one all the way to positive one along the hymenal ring. Okay, that's considered stage two. Stage three is just anything worse than plus one, except if it's all the way out and that's stage four. So that's kind of how I look at it. The most important stages that you're gonna be concerned about are stage two, three, and then four. So pardon me for my terrible, terrible drawings, but I tried to come up with some way to go over or prolapse again to, get, to solidify this idea of the pop cue. So in stage zero, essentially there's no prolapse. Your A, your AA and your BA are negative three. Your BP and your AP are negative three. Perfect, excellent, great responses. So we basically know that the BA point is between a negative three and a positive total vaginal length, excellent. So stage zero, no prolapse. This is the C is the cervix, and this is a terrible drawing of a cervix, but you can see that all of these points are negative three when it's stage zero. So C and D are basically gonna be exactly with maybe one or, cent one or two centimeters of descent um, of the apex, but pretty much everything's perfect, and that's stage zero. This is just an exam to kind of give an example to familiarize yourself with the pop cue. Again, this is the anterior, this is the apex, this is the posterior wall, and these are the measurements. So the measurements on these examples are gonna be the same across all, but I've changed the anterior and the posterior measurements. So here we have negative three and negative three, so no prolapse of the anterior vaginal wall, negative seven, you know, our C is well supported. If you look at the pouch of Douglas, it's negative nine, and then the posterior wall is well support, supported. Okay, so that's my example for stage zero. I, I realized that I filled in the prolapse in a very um, shocking color. I'll change it next time. But um, for stage one, the idea is that the most distal aspect of your prolapse, whether it's anterior, apical, or posterior, is over a centimeter above the hymenal ring. So this is the hymenal ring, and it's over a centimeter above the most distal portion of your prolapse, okay? So here's another example. Same grid. Anterior, apex, apex, posterior measurements. The measurements are the same in all these examples. And here you can see, okay, I got a little bit of anterior wall prolapse. Oh, look, my cervix is down a little bit. It's all the way down to negative three from negative seven. My D point is also down. So we are, we're going to say it's negative three as well because it's kind of in line with this cervix here and then negative two. But this is still stage one because none of the prolapse is beyond negative one. Okay, so let's go to stage two. This took a little bit more um, drawing expertise than I probably have, but let, let's go through this. So in stage two, it's going to be equal then or less than one centimeter proximal or distal to the hymenal ring. This is the hymenal ring. This anterior prolapse is on the hymenal ring, so that's zero, okay? So let's look at our example. Example, the anterior wall. Okay, I see this. The anterior wall both the AA and the BA point are all the way at zero. The C point still is at negative three. And then if we look along the posterior wall, there's a little bit of prolapse. So it's negative one for the AP and the BP, but our pouch of Douglas scores right up here. So that's a negative four. But this is stage two because the most distal aspect of the prolapse, whether it be anterior, apical, or posterior, is in the range of stage two. Okay. Stage three, this is when the drawings get even worse. Okay, so 
anterior wall. Well, look at that. That anterior prolapse is not good. And we can see that. And it's well beyond the hymen, so much so that I've labeled it positive two because those two points have come down. Let's go back up here. Okay. Now our cervix is right at the hymenal ring. So we can see that that's going to be a zero. And now I've created some posterior prolapse as well. And that's going to be plus one. So if, if we were looking just at the posterior wall, that would be stage two prolapse because it's within a centimeter of the hymenal ring. But we have to go to the most distal prolapse and that's the anterior wall. So this is gonna be stage three. This one's easy. Stage four, complete aversion within basically two centimeters of the total vaginal length. So as you can imagine, that cervix has come all the way down here. And so these are pretty easy to, to, to really score. So sometimes the harder bit is the stage two and the stage three. And this is an example here. You can see that the anterior wall, basically that measured three centimeters, that AA point has now flopped over here. So it's plus three instead of negative three. Your most distal edge of your anterior vaginal wall is all the way down here to plus seven. Your C point has moved all the way to plus eight. And then if you look at D, the D point is right down there at plus eight. And then if you're looking at the posterior wall, everything's come down. So that defined measured three centimeter for the um, posterior wall is now uh, plus three instead of negative three. And the most distal aspect of the posterior wall prolapse is all the way down here, plus seven. So when I think about prolapse, I really like to use a modified approach because every patient I don't get a pop cue stick out and then just sit there for a half an hour trying to get my measurements. Sometimes it's appropriate to do that, but a lot of times I do kind of a quick and dirty. And I'm gonna give Dr. Goldman uh, kudos on this. So really when you're looking at prolapse, a way to make it faster and more efficient is really on all your patients just to define the BA point, meaning the most distal prolapse of the anterior wall and the posterior wall as long as the as well as the apex so you've got three points there and those three points will really dictate what's going on from a prolapse standpoint so you can see here we move in there so the b a point as it's defined in this situation where it's stage four prolapse it's moved all the way out here and same with the bp and then your cervix. So you'll get the full extent of the prolapse. So um, I have a question now that I'd like to do a poll on. What is the stage of prolapse if a patient's pop Q is plus two, plus two, negative one, negative one, and negative one? Again, just to see if people are listening. Okay. While everyone is still answering. We'll keep going because I just have so many great slides. So what am I going to tell you? With all of my patients that come in for prolapse, they will have said someone told them they have prolapse and they're broken. There's something wrong with them. If they're not symptomatic, if they don't have hydronephrosis or a elevated PVR and they're feeling fine otherwise, we really need to do a better job, I think, at reassuring our patients that they're not broken. We need to ask them why they're here, what they're worried about, and then reassure them that they are in fact experiencing something that can be normal, but if it's bothersome, we can fix it. Okay, perfect. Stage three. I love it. Great. I also think it's important on our exams for all urologists to feel empowered to do a female exam. You will find things that people will miss you will be able to alleviate fears that patients have that maybe no one took the time to answer. This is your opportunity to really impact people's lives. Or if they have dyspareunia or pelvic floor tension or clitoral uh, phimosis, you find that you can make a huge dent in pa patients' lives. So I think even though it's a hassle sometimes to get people up in stirrups or to do a speculum exam or really ask the patient why they're here in the office seeing you, if you do this, your patients will be so very grateful. And I know the POP queue is super intimidating. I think they're going to share these slides broadly so you can go over it a couple of times. It's an exercise. And once you learn the system, you can see that it's really a great way to evaluate patients with prolapse. And um, putting it in your notes will be very useful in the future. So it's not impossible. And I think you all can do it. 
So then the next question is, we have a patient, they have prolapse, when are we going to treat it? Well, first you have to make sure prolapse is there. Sometimes people think they fill a bulge, but they really don't. And when they're pointing to something, they're just seeing the urethral meatus, or maybe it's a urethral diverticulum. There are a lot of different things that they could be feeling. But if they have prolapse, you also need to say, what kind of prolapse is it? Is it anterior? Is it apical? Is it posterior? Is it a combination? Which a lot are. You need to know if the patient's symptomatic because your entire treatment algorithm depends on the symptoms of the patient. If the patient's symptomatic, you want to know how much is it bothering you. So much so you want to do something about it or you just wanted to make sure it wasn't something bad and you want to watch it. So that conversation needs to happen. You also need to make sure they don't have hydro or obstruction. You can get kinking of the ureters bilaterally and you can't have renal failure from this. And I'm sure we've all had hospital consults where someone has come in with severe prolapse and then has an elevated creatinine and bilateral hydro. And then you may just need to put a pessor in or get them set up for a really uh, some sort of procedure. And then fundamentally, what does the patient want to do? That dictates exactly how you're going to proceed. So we have a lot of management options, observation. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, pessor and then surgery. I created this algorithm previously. So it's, it's a little bit more heavy towards obliterative procedures. But fundamentally, you need to know that the patient has some sort of bothersome prolapse. If they don't have symptoms, you're really going to not want to do something. But even if they have symptoms, sometimes they still don't want to do anything. And it's up to the patient as long as the patient's healthy. But you want to maybe consider a conservative measure such as a pessary trial. You notice that physical therapy isn't something we frequently institute. There is some benefit and sometimes it can decrease some sensations for patients, but it really doesn't reverse prolapse. When you think about, okay, they've tried a pessary, they either like it or don't. If they don't like it and they're interested in surgery, I like to have another breakdown. Some of my patients are much older and not with partners and aren't interested in sexual activity in the future. And in that case, I can break it down further. But for a lot of you, again, it's important to make sure they're not interested in sexual activity, not just not sexually active. But when you're talking about surgeries that are not obliterative, you're talking about two different approaches. There's the abdominal approach that a lot of the urologists are comfortable with because we're very comfortable with that uh, view of the the pelvis, um, or the vaginal approach, which a lot of us in FPMRS are very comfortable with. So observation, in almost all patients with asymptomatic prolapse, if patients have mild symptoms, they may want to watch it as well. And some people are just not ready to commit to anything. And it just takes them a little bit of time to kind of come around. Pessary, this works in symptomatic patients, in patients that aren't surgical candidates, although I'd argue most patients can have at least a colpectomy or a colpocleisis. You can do that under a spinal. Um, and in patients that just do not want to have surgery, there are some patients that don't, or they prefer less invasive alternatives. So this is a terrible picture of all the various pessaries that we can insert into people. I tend to go just with these rings. Um, sometimes the gelhorn is a reasonable option, but some of these more cumbersome ones are going to be challenging for patients to use on their own and then they're going to be coming to your office to have cleanings every three months. So um, if they don't want to have, if they want to have surgery, you got to think about the compartment. The anterior, isolated anterior prolapse is seen. It's less likely very frequently. It's in combination with an apical prolapse. You can have basically different repairs. So standardly, most of us do a midline plication as pictured here, but there is something called a perivaginal defect repair. This is an abdominal approach and it's basically a reapproximation uh, re of the fascia that has been torn. And sometimes we'll do this in combination with an abdominal approach. And there have been augmented, uh, mesh augmented prolapse repairs. I think that's fallen out of favor. You all know about the mesh kits for anterior repairs. They are require specialized training, specialized kits, and the FDA has basically taken them off the market. So that's not even something that we can discuss as much anymore. For apical prolapse, this is the C point. If we know any apical prolapse exists, most of the time we have to take care of it. If you don't take care of it, you're gonna have recurrence of your anterior prolapse or your posterior prolapse. There are repair options, the transvaginal approach, and I've listed the two repairs, and there are iterations of that, but the sacrospinous ligament suspension and the urosacral ligament suspension. And then there's a transabdominal approach with a lot of us being comfortable with this, and that's the abdominal sacral copopexy. Um, importantly, I 
didn't talk about it in this um, lecture, but you should realize that a lot of patients may desire to keep their uterus and you can do hysteropexy. So you can usually use most of those approaches and still maintain the uterus and the cervix. So if you're interested, uh, I'm sure that uh, we could talk about that for uh, a different day. But the sacrospinous ligament uh, suspension, again, is a vaginal approach. We basically go through the vagina and sometimes, and this is a sacrospinous ligament, a lot of times I preferentially put it on the right side, but sometimes people do bilateral that tends to splay the vagina um, posteriorly, I mean, at, at the apex. Uh, some people go on the other side. Uh, I think most of us veer towards the right, but there are all different variations of that. And I think, unfortunately, I heard the capio needle was uh, going out of favor or was being replaced. The uterosacral ligament suspension, this is classically what we do when we do our blue plate special with the anterior posterior repair with the vaginal hysterectomy and the uterosacral suspension. So basically we use all native tissue repair without any um, mesh or augmentation. The important thing when you do your uterosacral suspension is to notice the course of the uterosacral ligament. So this is uh, looking down into the pelvis and you can see with this laparoscopic instrument that we're pointing out the uterosacral ligament, but notice where the ureter is. And as you go more posterior in the pelvis, you'll see that the ureter diverges from the uterosacral. So sometimes doing a high uterosacral ligament suspension is preferred. The abdominal sacral co Pexy is very frequently utilized by urologists, and I think everyone is pretty familiar with this. Standardly, we use a mesh, but people have used autologous fascia, fascia in these repairs. I think we are familiar with the approach, um, but we do have longer operative times because this is a robotic procedure and there is a higher cost associated it, with it. And JAMA did publish on the risks of long-term mesh complications almost up to 10% on certain sacral copal Pepsi patients. So you have to realize that these mesh complications are very challenging because if it's a well-supported uh, well apex, you can have a very challenging time trying to remove the mesh and it may be an open procedure to remove the mesh arms. So posterior prolapse, this is typically a rectocele, however you could have a low enterocele. Um, when you see patients in the office, you really need to see what their symptoms are. If they're really feeling a bulge, are they truly splinting where they're reducing the bulge and then they can defecate, or are they just putting pressure on the perineum? And that's a different symptom. Um, dyspareunia can resolve, but you can create dyspareunia if you narrow the introitus too much or you build up the posterior wall too much. So that's an important consideration to have. We do know just based on gravity, posterior repairs have the lowest recurrence rate of all pelvic organ prolapse repairs. The way we standardly do it is a plication. So the way you've seen your FPMRS surgeons do it, there's some thought about doing a site-specific repair. So basically opening up the post um, um, the posterior epithelium and then reapproximating the fascia and sometimes just pulling the fascia down to obliterate that uh, defect. We really um, we really think that they work similarly. Again, you have the lowest risk of prolapse recurrence in these posterior repairs. I want to go on briefly just about obliterative procedures. I tend to use them a lot in my older patients or my patients that are very symptomatic or they can't keep a pessary in and they have obstruction or other urinary retention or hydronephrosis. And I think these obliterative procedures are really great because you can do them under a spinal anesthesia. You do have to make sure your patient is not sexually active and is not interested in the future to be sexually active. So you have to think long-term in these patients. So I don't think it's defined by age. I think it's defined more by what the patient and ultimately long-term wants. We know this is the most durable repair. We standardly do the copocleisis, the Lefort type in women with a uterus, creating those channels. Um, but in women that are post-hysterectomy, we do what's a colpectomy. We basically de-epithelialize the vagina and then we reduce the, um, the space. The cure rates are very high. The complications, I think, are very low. And mortality, even in our selected older patient population, is also very low. We do know that stress incontinence can happen in these patients that don't have concomitant stress incontinence procedures. But interestingly enough, post-op stress incontinence is, I think, lower than a lot of the other prolapse procedures we do. And that's probably because we're not resuspending that apex or changing that angle too much. We're just changing it slightly. 
So here is a graphic of a Lefort. You can see these are just squares. That's the posterior. And then we make an anterior square. We de-epithelialize it. We create these tunnels and people have to do interrupted. You've buried basically the cervix and created these tunnels. So there's going to be a tunnel opening here and also on the other side. And then you slowly obliterate the space so that you have something like this. Again, there's going to be a tunnel over here and a tunnel draining over here. This is kind of what you're going to see. This pictorial representation is not 100% accurate because what they forgot to do in this is create your perineal body repair, which I think is the main aspect of the repair that we have to focus on when we do this. So I spent a lot of time rebuilding their perineal body, almost doing a levator myorophy or pulling the sides of that vagina in to make the introitus very, very small. That way, if they do have prolapse recurrence, the introitus is small enough that you're not going to have symptoms from that bulge coming through, but you need it big enough so you can see the urethral meatus. So importantly for prolapse management, make sure to remember the apex. And when you're counseling patients, you need to make sure they know that prolapse is likely to come back. People may argue back and forth, but this is something you really need to prepare your patients for. So when you're managing them preoperatively, you need to define what you're going to cure. You're probably not going to cure everything under the sun, but you may get rid of that bulge. Hopefully you will get rid of that bulge and hopefully you'll help with some of their other symptoms as well. As well. But I never promise more than I can expect to deliver. You have to talk to them about the risk. You have to address stress incontinence. You have to talk about the risk of prolapse recurrence because it is real and it is frustrating for patients. You also need to talk about dyspronia and pelvic pain, which is again why I do that pelvic floor assessment, make sure those muscles aren't too tight. And you also need to talk about some shortening. You can't have vaginal shortening, especially if you do certain aggressive of, um, hysterectomies or other things. So be mindful of that. So I just gave you a whirlwind tour of pelvic organ prolapse. We talked a little bit about the GU exam. Hopefully everyone feels more comfortable with the POP-Q. And I wanted to introduce you to some of the basics in management. I think if you go back to my workflow where you can just go through that diagram in your mind when you see patients, it'll start to become pretty clear how to counsel them. And I like to do it in a step-by-step -step way. Um, I always try to do something conservative first because I want them to buy into a surgery by the time they're heading to surgery. Um, a few other take-home points. So I have harped on this. Please do a GU exam on, on your female patients with GU complaints. It is very important and you're going to find things that others may have missed. The POP-Q is important. It's scary, but if you keep practicing, you'll be able to do it and do it well. Treatment of your prolapse is based on the patient bother. It's not what you see. It's not what someone else sees. It's what the patient says. And always counsel your patients, like any quality of life patient, on what is a reasonable uh, expectation and outcome. And they had me put this, um, this picture up so that everyone can make sure to take the survey. Okay. I guess I've got some questions maybe. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Clifton. That was an excellent talk. Um, one of the comments was, this was the first time I've understood the pop cue after having explained over and over for three years. So um, that was one of the comments that was submitted. Um, but people have a couple of questions um, specifically about how you perform your measurements. So some of the questions were, you know, in terms of your technique in, per in measuring the different compartments in your clinic, what instruments and tools do you use besides the speculum? Um, and there was a question, you know, specifically, how do you measure your total vaginal length with or without the prolapse reduced? Um, so just a little bit more about how you perform your measurements. Oh, these are all very good questions. I think first and foremost, figure out what your clinic has available. If they have the old metal speculums, you can detach the metal speculum and just use the the, the bottom part of it. And then I get two of them. So I tie, I get like a half speculum in each each hand and then I use that because I can slide one out and push one back in and slide one out and push one back in. The other thing is don't use the biggest speculum you can find, right? So sometimes if I have a new nurse that comes in, she's giving me like this ginormous speculum and this poor woman, I'm it just make sure you have the right tool when you're starting. And so I like usually the medium sized one, sometimes the small one if I have a woman that has a lot of uh, sensitivity, but medium size and I take both of the tops off and then I'll use 
the bottom half and just kind of use that as a way to see the prolapse because you can really then define is it the apex falling down you clearly as you're pulling the top back you can see the cervix drop down or is it anterior or is it posterior and it allows you a lot more mobility than this the fixed speculum so that's what i generally do from just getting the pop cue again i tend to do that abbreviated pop cue they have the sticks the pop cue sticks and you can order them from any distributor and it's really nice it's got the centimeter markings on it so when i'm doing the vaginal length i have the patient basically lying down flat and then i don't have them strain but i put a little bit of pressure so basically i take the pop excuse pop cue stick i push it in so they feel a little bit of pressure because i really want to know the total vaginal length really is how much length of vagina do i have to work with for my prolapse repair so i don't want it to be artificially short because that'll change my counseling. I want to get an idea of really what the, the vaginal length is. So that's why I put a little bit of pressure in to get that full length to the hymenal ring. Um, uh, and those are mostly the tools. I use a little bit of, of lubrication. I don't do office histometry that much. I tend to have them hold their urine until they come in for the exam. And then what I do is I take that half speculum, I push it in just posteriorly. You don't want to push up on the bladder because that's going to artificially possibly obstruct the stress incontinence. You're going to push in gently and just hold it there with a finger. Always stand to the side, right? Stand to the side. Um, we've all been urinated on, on those exams, so everyone knows what I'm talking about. So you hold in, posterior, half speculum, hold in, have them cough, strain, bear down, and you'll see it. And if you don't see it come, you can always check the back of your speculum. So when you pull your speculum out, if you see a pool of urine there, you probably have stress incontinence. Now, if I'm checking when they complain of it or a bowl, and I don't see it on an exam because sometimes these patients have had pessaries for a very long time or they come in at the beginning of the day and you're not able to see it. I have them together. I say, this is going to be a strange exam. I always have a chaperone in the room. It's going to be a strange exam. I have them put a gown on and then I have them stand up and kind of put their legs apart and squat a little bit. I take that mirror, I move it in, I put it right underneath their legs and I say, I know this is strange, but we just want to seen and that way they do the exam together we sometimes make a little bit of a joke about how you never thought you'd be here like this um, and, and then usually the patients are pretty comfortable with it but a lot of times they want to know what's going on with them so they want you to get a really accurate picture of what they're seeing so they'll feel comfortable doing that and then on your exam can you go through a little bit more in detail how you assess the pelvic floor musculature uh, what yeah you do on the exam there? So I am so glad someone asked. I wasn't going to give a talk on pelvic pain because I don't believe that we want to spend the whole time talking about pelvic pain, but this is going to be another soapbox. I don't have a slide, but it's a soapbox. A lot of women that come in have basically, and men too, we have not realized that our pelvic floor exists for a very long time or ever. And so the first time my patients hear about their pelvic floor is when I'm telling them, when I'm having a conversation with them. Um, and when I'm having a conversation with them about their pelvic floor, they're like, this makes sense. But you have to prove to them it exists. So when I do my exam, I don't have a speculum in there or anything. I put gel on a, a glove finger and I tell them, this is going to be strange. I'm not going to be pushing on your bladder or your urethra or your rectum. I'm going to be pushing on the muscles of your pelvic floor. So what I do is I put my finger into the vagina and then I go up at kind of the two o'clock and the 10 o'clock position. And then I put my finger pretty much all the way in hugged gently though, because you always want to be gentle. You don't want them to clamp down because then you're never going to get your exam. And then I push my finger up and I'm putting pressure and then I pull towards myself along that sulcus and you'll feel these bands. It's almost like a, a muscle string, a back spasm, a knot. So sometimes you feel stranding, sometimes you'll feel a knot, but a lot of times you figure it out by looking at your patient's face. So I'm never looking at my hand when I'm doing the exam. I'm actually looking at my patient's face. So as I'm doing the exam and pulling out towards the hymen, I'm looking at her face. And when I see her go, I say, okay, we've got a problem. It shouldn't feel that way. So even my most stoic patients can't really prevent that automatic reflex. And that's how I kind of identify. And you have to do it anterior, laterally, and posteriorly because there are different groups that can be in spasm. It may not be the whole pelvic floor. It may just be one aspect of the levators. Great. There was a couple of questions that came through over a little bit of uh, confusion still regarding this C and D points uh -huh. um, in terms of how, 
So one person asked, you know, why is C still used um, after a hysterectomy? And then in terms of kind of determining whether there is an elongated cervix, and if you determine there is an elongated cervix, um, how do you counsel and address those patients differently? Okay, so excellent. Yes, I'm glad. It seems like people were listening because you start thinking about all these weird small points to the pop cue to try to make it make sense. And this is how you're going to make it make sense to you. You're going to use it over and over. You're going to ask these questions and then it starts making sense. So the D point is basically where the uterosacral ligaments kind of suspend the apex of the vagina. And because it's the pouch of Douglas, that only really exists if you have a uterus and a cervix present. The C point is the most important apical measurement in terms of looking at prolapse. So even though, and we'll kind of go over again the C and the D difference, but the C point really is your apex. So the C before you have a hysterectomy is the cervix. But when the cervix is removed because the patient's had a hysterectomy, it's going to be your vaginal cuff, the cuff, the C, the cuff, the cuff, the cervix. So that's the C point. Now, when you remove the cervix, you've kind of obliterated that D point. It basically gets all tucked into a repair. So this thing, after your hysterectomy, that goes away that goes away. And you really just have your cuff and your cervix. So, so don't think of the D point as a, uh, as a point that we're just not capturing. It just actually gets obliterated when you've done the hysterectomy. So the cuff becomes the most important point. So when you're doing it after, when you're doing that grid, let's see if I can find a grid picture. When you're doing the grid and you've had a hysterectomy, you're not going to see this. D will be gone. You put NA. This is NA. You don't even look at that point. So again, most important points, BA for prolapse, BA, BP, C. D only happens when you have a uterus, and that's for the pouch of Douglas, okay? So if they've had a hysterectomy, you just put NA there. It just does not exist anymore, okay? Now, when you're thinking about surgeries, if you have a patient that has a very long cervix, but the, the top of the vagina is well supported, right? The D point's well supported, but she comes in, she feels something, it's all hanging out, and it's really just a very long cervix and has had a little bit more prolapse and so fills it more. What that's going to tell me is she may be a candidate for just a hysterectomy and not need a vaginal vault reconstruction because her suspension is pretty okay. Majority of her symptoms are related to that cervix that is long and coming down somewhat. So in that case, you may consider, okay, maybe she needs an abdominal hysterectomy or a laparoscopic hysterectomy. I'd probably send her back to the GYN team and say, hey, do you guys want to take that out for me? Um, but that's why you'd have to know what the symptoms are. What is the bulge? Is the bulge actually prolapse or is it the cervix coming down? And so the measurement would show you this the C point if it were a long service could be negative three but the D point would be a negative nine so you wouldn't need to resuspend the apex so it would very much change what I would end up doing if that makes sense but the D point and a lot of the women we're seeing they've already had hysterectomies so that may be gone the C point's the important thing to remember Hopefully Great. that's um, Yeah, so then just, a, I don't know how much time we have left, but then there was just a few quick questions on the external genital exam again. Someone was hoping that you could just um, elaborate a little bit on what a caruncle is and what is its clinical significance and how to address and treat it. Oh, excellent. Let's talk about caruncles. They're very important. So um, they're important because a lot of women have them, right? So basically what a caruncle is, is an outpouching of the urethra, kind of this at the six o'clock position. So it's not like it's an overgrowth of something bad. It's just basically the vaginal epithelium is kind of dried out. It's going more proximally and the lip, I think of it as a lip of the urethra is kind of pouching outward. And so what happens is when you have an exam, sometimes you can have bleeding. So people will have blood in their underwear. They can have irritation with sex. 
they can just have plain irritation or they can have an exam and someone notices it. And so that's kind of how they present. The treatment is vaginal estrogen. So vaginal estrogen does a really good job of softening that tissue. It may not get rid of the caruncle 100%, but usually it, it causes it to shrink quite a bit. And then you feel comfortable. When it shrinks with vaginal estrogen, you say it's probably not something bad. However, if you have something that's discolored and it's not shrinking with vaginal estrogen and it's bleeding or it looks odd, you may have to biopsy to make sure it's not something else. But they're classically at the six o'clock position. They're, they have this very classic appearance. Sometimes it's a little bit darker pink to purple. Um, you see the rest of the urethra there. Um, and you will find when you do your cystoscopies or you're doing your examination, just take a second before you do your cysto to look at the vaginal exam and see, okay, this is kind of the spectrum of what looks normal, what's not. And when you have your mentors there, they, you can say, is that a cronkle? Is that what it looks like? And they'll say yes and no. A lot of us as urologists kind of take for granted that it's kind of a normal finding. Um, but knowing what it is, monitoring it, and making sure that that patient isn't having symptoms and has follow-up is important. And then just one last question on the, since we're on the external exam, just how, when you're examining a patient, how do you define the difference between the introitus and the hymenal ring? Oh, the, uh, the introitus is just the opening of the vagina. It's pretty vague. The hymenal ring is very defined. So when you do your pelvic exam and you're looking, you will see the hymenal remnant. That's going to be in a circle. It's always going to be the same way. The introitus is kind of, people think of the opening, and I don't really talk about an introitus other than the whole picture, but the hymenal ring is very clearly defined by the remnant. So you'll see maybe not the intact ring, but you'll see portions of it and that'll define the hymen. And that's what you look for. And you can do that during your exams when you're doing your prolapse procedures with your faculty. You can say, hey, show me exactly where that hymenal remnant is. And then it just starts to be kind of commonplace. And then you'll be doing that on exam and you'll reference everything to the hymen. Great. All right. Well, thank you to both of you, Dr. Clifton and Michelle, for an awesome session. Really high yield. Um, just a reminder to everybody, we've got a survey on our website, uh, and we're going to be putting up the slides, the video, and, and re any remaining Q&A on there when we're, when we're through with it. So thank you both so much, um, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.